functionality of a battery machine versus a propane? Um, do you sacrifice anything in a battery machine? And there's no right or wrong answer. Both those machines, I think, have their place in the market. But I've heard people's concern about a battery not being as fast as a propane, uh, not being as aggressive as a propane. Um, are those true or is, is the technology advanced to the point to where battery machines can really perform at an equal level to a propane machine? On our battery machines, we've come a long way in the last couple of years as far as speed. Um, we've always tried to force the machines to do more than what they were really capable of doing. And um, we've recently discovered some technology that is not really new, but it's, it's more usable in our industry than what we thought. <clears throat> it's, a, it's actually a motor that we can vary the speed on the motor and allow us a propane-like response. We, you know, whenever you're running a propane machine, when you're driving through a doorway, uh, you're going to idle the engine down and make the machine a little bit easier to drive going through a doorway or through a couple of offices or something. Uh, and then when you get into the job and you, you can rev the machine up and you can have a more aggressive machine. So the, the battery machines are now very similar to that. We can drive the machine slowly into the job and we can uh, speed the machine up. Are you going to get 400 feet a minute out of one of our propane machine or out of one of our battery machines? You can get the cyclone. Yeah, uh, it's it's fast. It's got a very large battery pack. It's going to be a propane ish driving. We use the same pumps on the propane machines as we do on the uh, battery machines. So you're not going to lose any capabilities there. They all have the same torque. Uh, we're getting near the same feet per minute. Uh, this, you know, for example, the storm machine. 270 feet per minute. And, you know, even though we've been asked, okay, where is the magic number? Where is the, you know, from zero to nine on our actual, you know, throttle that would vary the speed of the machine. Okay. Where is the sweet spot? Uh, my response is there's not one. Uh, you walk on a job site, your operator is going to have it on nine. If there was an 11, he'd have it on 11 because they want that machine to run as fast as they can go. Uh, an eight hour runtime is, is uh, not in their vocabulary because uh, if you've got 2000 square feet of VCT to take up, are you going to run it to where your batteries last the longest or are you going to run it so you're going to get the job done? You're going to get the job done. You're going to get out of there. So um, that variable speed is very functional when you're trying to go around a maybe a, a, a toilet basin in an area where you have a $8,000 granite countertop in there in a kitchen somewhere, and you want to be very precise, you want to slow that machine down so it's not as aggressive, but uh, we can make our battery machines just as aggressive as anybody wants to be. Do you think that propane machines are on their way out because battery technology is becoming so advanced? Um, you know, one of the negative things about propane I've always heard is just the, the required maintenance on them because they are you know, fossil fuels, filters, everything else, they're dirty in some applications. Um, do, do, does propane still have a place in the industry, maybe on larger machines, or do you feel like batteries really kind of taking over the industry? Well, let's, let's be straight. Nobody maintains these things. <laughs> nobody, nobody, I'm not gonna say nobody, but most people don't uh, pay as much attention to the propane engine maintenance as what we would like for them to. So. Uh, very little maintenance on either way, very little maintenance on a propane engine. If you change the oil every 50 hours to 100 hours and change the air filter every 20 hours on all these machines, that's pretty much it. Um, but yes, um, unless you're, you know, let's just say 10 years from now, my personal opinion in 10 years, the only way you're going to, the only place you're going to operate a propane machine is on a parking deck outside, uh, you know, maybe a tennis court, maybe uh, a basketball court that's inside where you've got some maple wood flooring that's been uh, compromised and are going to be taking that out. But as far as all of these jobs right now that these guys are running propane machines indoors, I believe that a lot of country, a lot of states are going to go to the same Thing that the Californians have done. There's just absolutely no fossil fuels whatsoever inside of a building. And uh, that's driving the battery technology uh, to be more and more technologically advanced in all of our battery machines. So 
Uh, we're already able to do um, pretty much everything you can do with, with uh, the bigger machines and the propane machines, with the battery machines, with the exception of with a propane machine, your fuel cell can be changed out in 20 seconds. With a battery machine, your fuel cell can be recharged in eight hours, 12 hours, you know, depending on the equipment. Okay, um, so let's move on to a little bit of a different subject. And one thing that's always been kind of, it's always been asked of me and it's always been kind of confusing and I'm not sure I fully understand it. But talk to me about the difference between a hydrostat drive and a direct drive. Benefits, features, um, I know you're, you're hydrostat, but why did you choose to go hydrostat? What are the advantages of that? We have, uh, you know, in, in the very initial concept of our equipment, we use some hydrostats and, um, we got a lot, we got really good controllability. Um, we did it because that's, that's just the first thing that came to our mind. And, and later on, we thought, you know what, these, uh, these gear pumps are, extremely inexpensive you know you're talking a $300 pump versus a $2,000 pump and so um, we had an issue with controllability um, that we we even went to some really high-end valving to try to steer them you know with the gear pump scenario you are actually uh providing X amount of oil that has to be pumped through a valve and you control how much oil goes to that wheel motor for driving purposes. Uh, and you control that through a valve, and, you know, and so trying to limit the amount of oil that's going to drive the machine forwards, backwards, left and right in a skid steer fashion is, uh, especially on a battery machine, um, we found that they were too jerky. And if you are somewhere between a stopped position and a full forwards position, if you're anywhere in between, then you're actually pulling more amperage on the motors. You know, you're actually requiring more horsepower to drive it slow than it did to drive at full speed because you're sending a lot of oil back to the tank. So we, we have tried and, you know, spent literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop things with the gear pump that was drivable as it would be with a, a hydrostat. And we can't get there. We cannot get there and get it something that's acceptable to my customers. Uh, we've tried it and we get a, we get a thumbs down from our customers. You know, that's, that's not going to cut it. Uh, go back and try it again. Fortunately for us, we do have customers that do have a very loud voice and, uh, you know, they they use the right words to get me motivated to make a machine that is drivable. Like, you know, like our twister, our twister is absolutely the most drivable machine out there on the market. Uh, so whenever you have a customer that's used to driving that twister machine with the drivability it has, and they buy a, a uh, less expensive, uh, smaller, machine from you they want that same performance and drivability well and that's one thing i've always heard about the oem scrapers is they drive like cadillacs you know they are very smooth um very operator friendly and more when it comes to training a new operator you know if you get on one of these machines for the first time um i i've i've heard that people can just it's like a duck to water they get to it very quickly they're driving around edges and walls with no problem at all with some of the other machines, there's a learning curve because they are so jerky and you have to learn to adapt to that. Um, so I'm assuming you give, contribute that to the hydrostat drive. The hydrostat drive is what they use on nearly every, well, I'm going to say nearly every zero turn mower in the turf industry utilizes a hydrostatic transmission. And part of that is because, uh, you know, you can run a couple of big uh, 20 gallon a minute pumps and use a very small hydraulic tank, um, you know, and whenever you're looking at these machines, you're trying to uh, fit a lot of stuff in a small enough package you can drive through a doorway and get into an office. So if you can get away from using a 20 gallon tank and use a three gallon tank, that's what I'm gonna go for. Um, as far as drivability, if you have the right operator, they can make anybody's machine perform extremely well. I've had a guy come in there with hands as big as baseball mitts and drive an old 
an old, ancient, archaic, primitive machine with the uh, four-cylinder Nissan engine on it and uh, valve controls and educate me really quick that those machines can be operated in an extremely smooth manner, um, embarrassingly smooth manner. But if you throw, like you said, if you throw a new guy on, on one of those machines, he better have a seat belt and a rodeo hat on because it's going to be a, a fun day for him. Uh, so throw that same guy in one of our machines with a 50 horsepower, 60 horsepower engine, rev that engine up to full RPM, and he can write his name in the floor with it. Um, we have just, you know, on, on our side, we've just chosen to use the most efficient pump for the dollar and the most efficient pump and, and steering mechanism to give the, the, the guy the controllability. There's a lot of things out there that you have to drive the machine around and be careful. Um, a lot of guys would, would assume we're, we're all working in Walmarts where you got 30, 40, 50,000 square feet of open area. That's never the case. You've got bookshelves and, and toilets and sinks and things that you've got to work yourself around. Things in the floor you got to work around. So drivability is, is of utmost concern. Also, there's that, that moment when you're driving it on a trailer, up in a trailer on a ramp. And so you need to have controllability in that. Thank you for watching and we hope you enjoyed this second segment of the BMD Learning Series focused on Ride On Floor Scrapers. Please join us next week for the third installment and don't forget to subscribe, like, and share if you found this video informative and beneficial to your business. And don't forget to click that bell icon to be notified when we post a new video.